So we're going to look here at newborn substance exposure, and you could also consider this to be fetal substance exposure because a lot of these problems occur uh, when the newborn is exposed to these substances while still in utero. Uh, this is a pretty complicated topic because there are a lot of different substances that uh, the baby can be exposed to while in utero. Uh, however, there's, a, uh, there's a, a lot of symptoms when we're talking about neonatal abstinence that are quite similar and span across uh, uh, all of these substances, at least the ones that cause neonatal abstinence syndromes. Uh, but there are uh, there are some differences, so we're going to go through all of them. Uh, we'll also talk about some general considerations, just an overall overview of uh, substance exposure. We'll talk about general management. There is sort of a general approach that you're going to take um, to any kind of newborn abstinence, and then an example algorithm. So overall, pregnancies in women who abuse drugs uh, or alcohol are at higher risk for poor prenatal care. They tend to be of low socioeconomic status. They might not be insured. They are at higher risk for prenatal STDs, intrauterine growth retardation, premature rupture of membranes. Uh, their babies will be at risk for sudden infant death syndrome. And overall, there is increased fetal and, and infant morbidity and mortality. The effects due to exposure to these drugs can include neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is more of an acute uh, effect. Baby is exposed to drugs while in utero, baby builds up a tolerance, and then baby is not exposed to drugs um, and goes through a withdrawal like anybody else. And we, can, we call that neonatal abstinence syndrome, and there's various manifestations of it depending on what the uh, what what the uh, substance was, and sometimes there's more than one, and we have to consider that too. Uh, but uh, that's uh, one of the primary uh, effects of uh, of substance exposure, and certainly not all of these substances that we're going to talk about cause neonatal abstinence. Some of them cause it more than others. Uh, some of them don't even cause it at all. Uh, but uh, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, some of these uh, can cause malformations. Particularly uh, when we're thinking about infant size, we're talking about intrauterine growth retardation, uh, small for gestational age, um, and then uh, there's also malformations that can happen uh, to the heart, to the GI tract, to the brain, uh, particularly neurodevelopmental issues, uh, and then uh, particularly when we talk about alcohol, uh, there's craniofacial abnormalities that are pretty prominent. And then also, very importantly, long-term effects that will follow the baby throughout their life. And particularly here, uh, there's neurodevelopmental problems, including mental retardation, uh, but there's also uh, certain drugs that can, um, that can affect uh, psychiatric uh, issues, and, uh, and there's uh, drugs that can affect the heart, and all of those certainly are going to lead to long-term uh, problems. Exposure, particularly to industrial agents, uh, particularly when we're thinking about toluene, which we'll talk about, may be unbeknownst to the mother and therefore it won't be reported to the physician. Uh, mothers are often reluctant, and this is really important to admit to substance abuse because either fear that social services will take the baby away or they're just ashamed. And that's a you know, natural response because we're afraid to admit to things that, uh, you know, like weaknesses in our lives. And usually people resort to drugs because they're weak in some way and they look towards the drugs for a way out. Uh, all mothers, no matter what their socioeconomic status, should be asked about substance abuse. And the way you should do this is, of course, in a very non-threatening uh, atmosphere, make sure you remind the mother that this is a confidential meeting. I'm, I'm not allowed to tell uh, anyone, if you're abusing drugs, uh, that stays between you and me. Uh, but uh, you, you should start out uh, by uh, asking the least quote-unquote ostracized drugs. So, for instance, ask her, uh, are you, do you smoke? You know, most people aren't ashamed to admit if they smoke. Do you drink alcohol? And then you can work your way up. Uh, do, you have, uh, do you use uh, any kind of sedatives? Uh, any non-prescription drugs? Do you use heroin, methadone, cocaine, methamphetamine? Work your way up to the more, uh, more 
shameful drugs, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, it makes a it makes it a little more of a uh, of a non threatening, uh, comfortable environment. And particularly, I mean, you want to ask all mothers, but particularly you want to ask mothers who have low socioeconomic status. They tend to just statistically be at higher risk. And then, of course, mothers with a history of substance abuse. Uh, in addition to maternal history, you should also obtain uh, the, a urine drug screen uh, if you suspect substance abuse, uh, especially from the baby, but also from the mother. Uh, you, can, you should get a meconium drug screen. That also tends to be more accurate than urine drug screen. So meconium drug screen and then umbilical cord testing. There it is there. Okay, so the clinical signs of, uh, of neonatal abstinence syndrome in the neonate uh, usually are neurological. Uh, they can be gastrointestinal. They can also be uh, autonomic and just sort of generalized. So the neurologic symptoms, and you're going to notice that these are really just uh, nonspecific symptoms, and they really are, uh, but you'll note these babies, that they're quite different from the other healthy babies. And, you know, most of these babies, they tend to be term or maybe just a little preterm, and you'll note that there's some differences uh, between them and babies that are otherwise healthy. So neurologically, uh, they tend to be very irritable. That's a common symptom across all the drugs. Uh, there may be increased wakefulness, especially with withdrawal from the sedatives. A high-pitched cry. Tremor is also very common across all of the drugs. Increased muscle tone and DTRs. Uh, yawning and uh, sneezing. That should say sneezing. And then seizures. And that's uh, one of the more problematic uh, issues that can happen. Uh, GI-wise, uh, mostly we're concerned about feeding and then their tendency to vomit and have diarrhea. And that is a problem as far as fluid status. So if there's uh, frequent vomiting and diarrhea, really if there's any, we need to make sure that these babies are hydrated. If not, uh, then it's generally a good idea to have them on IV fluids. Uh, autonomically, there can be fever or temperature instability. So while they're in the hospital, they're going to need frequent temperature checks. Uh, there, can, there can be diaphoresis, nasal congestion, modeling, uh, piloerection, and then mild elevations in the respiratory rate and blood pressure. And you'll see some of these in certain drugs and some of them uh, in others. And then also please note that depending on the drug, the time of, uh, of onset or constellation or the severity of symptoms can vary. Uh, usually heroin uh, tends to cause the worst withdrawal symptoms, uh, whereas things like um, alcohol or, uh, or tobacco really don't cause um, that many, if any. Um, toluene, too, would fall in that category. Also remember to consider the possibility of polysubstance abuse. People who abuse one drug are certainly at a much higher risk to abuse another drug. And so if there's both cocaine and barbiturate uh, withdrawal, you want to know that. Okay, so starting with heroin and opioids, and those opioids can uh, include uh, uh, buprenorphine, uh, codeine, Vicodin, Dilaudid, morphine, Percocet, uh, but heroin certainly would be the worst. Uh, this tends to be the most severe presentation of neonatal abstinence syndrome clinically just because of the significant withdrawal effects. Mothers who abuse heroin in half of the cases will have a baby who's uh, low birth weight or small for gestational age. And the withdrawal effects will uh, be pretty, happen pretty quickly uh, within the first day or two of, uh, of life. The symptoms can be any of those fetal abstinence uh, uh, symptoms, uh, but the more irritable, hyperactive symptoms are going to be more prominent. Uh, so tremors and irritability, uh, hyperactivity, increased deep tendon reflexes, hypertonicity, uh, even seizures can happen. Uh, vomiting and diarrhea are really, really problematic uh, in, in these babies because when you think about it, uh, the opioids, are a, uh, they make you more constipated. So when you're withdrawing, you're going to be uh, more diarrheic, if that's a word. So if you're going to have a tendency towards diarrhea um, when, you're, uh, when you're withdrawing. The workup 
and, and uh, this is going to go for most of, uh, of, of the drugs when you're working uh, them up, um, but you want to get a meconium in urine toxicology uh, and also consider a urine toxicology screen on the mother as well. That can be helpful. A metabolic profile, and this is going to be important. You want to include calcium and magnesium levels, especially that calcium, because hypocalcemia can present in a very similar way uh, to these withdrawal symptoms, particularly with the tremors and irritability, hyperactivity, increased de deep tendon reflexes. Also get a heel stick blood glucose because hypo uh, hypo hypoglycemia can have uh, some similar effects as well. So you're kind of just making your differential there. Cocaine and methamphetamine tend to not cause neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, but it does tend to cause uh, uh, prenatal complications, so placental abruption, premature labor, intrauterine growth retardation, and then fetal asphyxia and, uh, and intraventricular hemorrhage. So cocaine is always going to be part of your workup when you have a woman with abdominal pain or pelvic pain and she's pregnant and you do a ultrasound and you see blood within the placenta, uh, then you're, con uh, you're, you're concerned for placental abruption. Cocaine is a possible cause. Babies who are born to mothers who abuse cocaine and similar stimulants are at higher risk of GU and GI anomalies, as well as cardiac anomalies. So you definitely want to get uh, a, a, an echocardiogram on these babies uh, just as a screening. Uh, developmental delays later on, neurobehavioral abnormalities, and lower IQs. Um, you'll also want to screen these babies uh, with a uh, cranial ultrasound to look for intraventricular hemorrhage. So some differences uh, based on the drug that you might not do with some of the other drugs, just based on what this is associated with. Uh, the neonatal abstinence syndrome uh, tends to not exist, but what you may see is a slightly decreased arousal and physiologic stress around 48 to 60 hours of life. This makes perfect sense because this is what an adult would do when they're withdrawing from cocaine. Cocaine is a stimulant. You take away the stimulant, you're going to have a withdrawal syndrome of being tired. Phenobarbital uh, tends to uh, cause a neonatal abstinence syndrome in the first two weeks of life, and it includes prominent irritability, sleep, sleeplessness, excessive crying, and a voracious appetite. Uh, there can also be hiccups, regurgitation, and most problematically, seizures. So again, this really makes a lot of sense here, because what does phenobarbital do? It's a sedative. And so when you're withdrawing from a sedative, of course it's going to be hard to sleep, you're going to be irritable, uh, so the excessive crying and the prominent irritability. And what is phenobarbital given for in children? It's the first line agent when a child is having a seizure. When a child under the age of one is having a seizure. And so withdrawing from it can lead to seizures. Um, so I just wrote down here, please note um, that sleeplessness, irritability, and seizures can be seen in any patient withdrawing from barbiturates and benzodiazepines. And you could just as easily substitute benzodiazepines up here, uh, but phenobarbital is the most commonly abused drug. Tobacco and nicotine uh, is not associated with uh, a neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, but it is important as far as the long-term effects on the baby. So tobacco and nicotine have a negative effect on fetal growth, and smoking is directly associated with intrauterine growth retardation, and the severity is directly correlated to how much the person smokes. So certainly no smoking is the way to go, uh, but even mothers who smoke just half a pack per day, and that's just 10 cigarettes per day, and that's quite low for somebody who is a smoker. Um, that's on the lower end. A lot of people smoke a pack, a pack and a half a day. Um, even if they only smoke a half pack per day, the risk of intrauterine growth retardation, the incidence, is twice as much as mothers who don't smoke. And that risk increases proportionally uh, with more smoking. The adverse long-term effects are mild developmental handicaps, and then uh, there is evidence that significant exposure to secondhand smoke can lead to similar short and long-term sequelae. Now, a lot of states in the United States have banned smoking indoors, 
Um, so that's useful for people who work as like waitresses uh, um, in, in uh, cafes and stuff, so they're not exposed to secondhand smoke all the time. Um, I think that this study was uh, was was looking at significant exposure, not just uh, you know occasional exposure to secondhand smoke, but certainly the safest uh, the, the safest uh, uh, place would be no exposure to either smoking or secondhand smoking. Uh, like I said, neonatal abstinence is rare. We're more so looking at the uh, the prenatal effects and possibly the long term uh, handicaps. Uh, the most studied uh, one is alcohol. This is a big one. Uh, alcohol is the most commonly used legal drug uh, used during pregnancy, and prenatal exposure to alcohol is the most common preventable cause of mental retardation in the United States. So that's really important uh, because this is an uh, epidemiological issue. The effects are associated with the amount of drinking, both the frequency and the amount consumed per session. So moderate to heavy drinking is really associated with the problems. Now, if a woman happens to not know she was pregnant for the first month or two, which is not uncommon, and she said, well, gee, I had a few beers, is the risk of, of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome really high? Probably not. This is more seen with... Uh, with, with really frequent drinking and with binge drinkers. Um, a few drinks, while it's not a good idea, you should never recommend it, it's always good to com completely abstain from alcohol during pregnancy. As a clinical, uh, uh, as a clinical fact, or uh, you know, if, if, if a mother asks you, um, am I going to be okay, if there was only a couple accidental exposures to alcohol, you can tell her, well, we can't completely rule out fetal alcohol syndrome, it's likely, statistically likely, that there won't be any sequelae. This usually happens due to frequent uh, alcohol consumption and high alcohol consumption. So th this is the cause, of course, of fetal alcohol syndrome. It has an incidence of around uh, half to two in every 1,000 live births, so very frequent. And the mechanism is probably due to alcohol interfering with the uh, absorption of zinc and amino acids through the placenta. And then there's also some dysmorphologies, and these dysmorphologies that you see in uh, the infant are pretty prominent. Uh, so uh, the first thing you're going to see is a flattened philthrum, and the philthrum is, if you just feel with your finger up above your lip, that little indentation, that's the philthrum. And babies who have fetal alcohol syndrome will quite prominently not have that philthrum or it will be less prominent. They also uh, tend to have a shorter palpebral fissure, so their upper lip looks a little small, and then a uh, thin vermilion of the uh, upper lip. Um, that's also going to make the upper lip uh, look pretty small. Uh, and then finally, microcephaly. And that's a little bit uh, less common. Uh, you'll see that in the more severe cases. Uh, but I'll show you a picture of that. Okay, so if uh, there's an acute ingestion of alcohol shortly before labor and delivery, then baby is going to have alcohol in their blood. So the baby will exhibit symptoms of essentially what's a drunk baby. So hyperactivity and tremor usually lasts for around three days. It takes the baby a long time to clear that alcohol out because this has to go through the fetal or through the the infant system, infant liver, which is, which is not fully developed, and so this is going to last for about three days. Remember, the time it takes for you to clear alcohol out of your system is related to your liver function. And then this is also followed then by a little bit of a baby hangover, uh, which is, be, is going to be a lethargic period for about 48 hours. So just like what you would see in an adult with... Uh, being exposed to alcohol, but a little bit exaggerated because the baby is smaller and it takes longer to clear up. So this is fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, here's uh, three small boys uh, who uh, have fetal alcohol syndrome. You see very prominently there's really no philthrum. This baby has a little bit of a philthrum, but this baby doesn't have one at all, and you don't really see one in this boy uh, either. Uh, note also the uh, uh, very small upper lip. You don't see much of an upper lip at all compared to the lower lip. This baby has a little bit of microcephaly. Uh, 
going on here, but I don't see it in these children. And then uh, some of the other uh, uh, symptoms of fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, there's also going to be a lower IQ. Um, there can be neurodevelopmental uh, issues as well. Um, so uh, you can also see hypoplasia, optic nerve, uh, hypoplasia, uh, hypotonia, poor feeding. Marijuana is the most frequently used illegal drug in the U.S. However, it is legal in some states. Uh, those would be Washington State in the Northwest, Colorado in the Mountain West, and then Alaska. Uh, and it's also legal very recently, as of last week, uh, in the capital city of Washington, D.C. It is not associated with withdrawal symptoms, but there can be tremor and disordered sleep patterns, but that's very rarely picked up on. Long-term effects in humans are unknown, uh, and I'm talking about human uh, infants. Long-term teratogenic effects in uh, human infants are unknown, uh, but there have been studies in mice that shows uh, that there is a decline in higher thinking skills and processing memories. So we don't know if that happens in humans, but there is studies in mice. Okay, and finally, toluene. This is uh, one of those occupational uh, exposures, but exposure can be intentional. Uh, some people sniff paint or glue. Um, it's a legal, uh, something that's very easy, easy to get, uh, get a hold of. It causes uh, some, uh, some psychotic symptoms. Uh, so I don't know why people do this, but people do. Um, it can also be occupational in the dry cleaning business, uh, cleaning business, construction, uh, painters, they can be exposed to this as well, people who work on ships. Uh, the effects can include intrauterine growth retardation, microcephaly, cranio, uh, craniofacial anomalies, very similar to fetal alcohol syndrome. There can also be renal anomalies and developmental delays, but this also is not associated with a neonatal abstinence syndrome. So I just want to point out that uh, alcohol is not associated with a neonatal abstinence syndrome. It is, though, associated with these symptoms uh, after the baby's born, but that's only if there's an acute ingestion. If the mother drinks alcohol right before uh, labor and delivery, like within 24 hours or so. Uh, so that, but that's just the baby having alcohol on their blood and then clearing it out. Okay, so then also prescription medication, and you should know to avoid these during pregnancy, uh, but these are the things that it can cause. So anti-epileptic drugs, sometimes they're not avoidable, particularly if the mother has a seizure disorder. It would be great to avoid them, but uh, stopping an anti-epileptic drug just for pregnancy uh, is not uh, advisable because when a mother has a seizure, that puts the baby at much more risk than these anti-epileptic drugs. So, but these cause, of course, neural tube defects and then also possibly some craniofacial abnormalities. SSRIs, uh, another one that you might not necessarily stop during pregnancy, but it would be ideal, can cause uh, a neonatal abstinence syndrome and also pers uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension. SSRIs are a broad class of drugs. Not all of them uh, are the same or cause the same things. Paroxetine is the worst offender uh, of all of the SSRIs. NSAIDs, of course, are not advisable during pregnancy. Um, we usually give them Tylenol for, for pain. Um, this can cause premature constriction of the ductus arteriosus. Uh, and then ACE inhibitors can cause intrauterine renal insufficiency, which that would be a problem because, remember, baby needs the kidneys to make, uh, to make urine and ultimately the amniotic fluid. Statins uh, are definitely contraindicated. Those can cause limb defects and defects of the nervous system. Lithium, very commonly prescribed to bipolar patients, uh, can cause Epstein's anomaly of the heart, as well as other cardiac and kidney diseases. Methimazole, we prefer to use PTU uh, for Graves patients. Uh, this can cause hypothyroidism, as well as a scalp condition known as aplasia cutis. Tetracyclines uh, are uh, not preferred as far as an antibiotic. Uh, these can cause teeth discoloration. The teeth will become yellow or brown. We also don't give tetracyclines to young children for the same reason. And then warfarin can cause the Dandy Walker malformation, which is uh, hypoplasia of the cerebellum, as well as laryngomalacia, which would affect the voice, 
uh, congenital heart diseases, and craniofacial abnormalities. So your general management for a patient, a baby that you uh, suspect may be uh, exposed to substance uh, is going to be a meconium in urine toxicology, and then of course consider urine toxicology on the mother as well. You want to get a BMP, including calcium and magnesium levels, exclude hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, get that heel stick blood glucose for the same reason. You'll do a, well, usually it's the nurse who does this, but a Finnegan score, and this is very commonly done in, uh, in the uh, newborn nursery and neonatal unit. Uh, I'll show you uh, an example of what the Finnegan score is. You don't need to memorize this for the, for the USMLE. And then an echocardiogram. Uh, for uh, babies that you suspect may have uh, heart defects. Okay, so this is the Finnegan scoring. Uh, don't memorize this. But what you can do is look at this and say these are the symptoms that happen in babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, so neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, when you add all these scores up, it's going to be diagnosed uh, when there's three consecutive scores of more than eight points. And that, these are typically taken every four hours, or if one score is ever greater than 24 points. The general management for neonatal abstinence syndrome, there is no consensus agreement on the best therapy for infants in neonatal abstinence syndrome, and no single drug has been identified as optimally effective. So uh, my source is the uh, University of Iowa Children's Hospital. Um, and uh, they recommend uh, morphine sulfate orally, initially starting at uh, 0.05 milligrams per kilogram every four hours. That can be titrated up if necessary. Uh, if the baby has been exposed to several substances or they don't improve on morphine alone, they can be given phenobarbital uh, as well uh, as an addition. Uh, there's some evidence that morphine or a combination of morphine and phenobarbital is more beneficial than phenobarbital alone. Some sources say you can just start with phenobarbital. It's for this reason why I added in here that morphine should be given first and then phenobarbital uh, if necessary. You can just give morphine though. Uh, so uh, paragoric is a, uh, a, another drug that can be used. Now this is off-label, so I wouldn't expect this to be on the USMLE, but it is commonly clinically administered if diarrhea is a really significant problem and this is just a tincture of opiate. Uh, you want to, of course, frequently monitor these babies as you saw in the Finnegan scoring. These are done often. This is a, something that you follow. Uh, Non-pharmacologic support includes swaddling, rocking, uh, reducing the sensory or environmental stimuli, and then, of course, consultation of a neonatologist should be considered if this becomes a little more complicated. So this is an example algorithm. Again, this is also from the University of Iowa. Uh, starts off if you diagnose neonab neonatal abstinence syndrome, uh, if there's polysubstance abuse, uh, you can consider uh, phenobarbital, if there's no stabilization, uh, if the Finnegan scores are stabilized, you can, uh, you can give, uh, uh, you can just hold yourself on the morphine, um, but if they don't stabilize, you can uh, increase the morphine dose, but they do recommend morphine as the first line of therapy, and if there's uh, no stabilization, uh, then you can give phenobarbital. So that's what they recommend. Uh, because there's no agreement, I don't expect that you will be asked on the USMLE which drug to give. Uh, however, if you're given a list of options, you shouldn't be asked between morphine and phenobarbital. So if one of those are on there, uh, then you want to choose one of those. But uh, I don't expect you to get asked between the two of these. So if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and uh, write me a note below.